This is Supported Sexy, episode 230, with Valencia Taylor, owner of Shine Beauty Culture and author of Evolving Beauty. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm happy to have you here because it just would not be the same without you. And today, if you are a beauty girl or beauty guy, no judgment, no judgment here. Beauty girl, beauty guy, if you're into the beauty industry, thinking about making beauty products, anything like that, this is the episode for you. Today, we have beauty expert Valencia Taylor, and Valencia is the owner of Shine Beauty Culture, which is a beauty consultancy, and she is also the author of two books. One is the book Evolving Beauty, which gives tips about entering the beauty industry, something she said she doesn't feel like she had when she first entered the industry a decade ago, and also the Evolving Beauty Planner, which is a tool to help you plan your journey through the industry and in being successful. And what I love in this episode is we not only talk about beauty and the industry, but also about this idea of success, what success looks like to all of us, and also the importance of being fulfilled not just successful. So in this episode, what you'll also learn from Valencia is that marketing is still a core part of business, even in the age of digital. One of the biggest mistakes beauty brands make, how to know when a product is working and when it isn't, the value of utilizing guerrilla marketing tactics, her beauty breakthrough theorem, how to view beauty as a tool of empowerment, Valencia's advice for being successful and happy, as we talked about, Also, when it comes to your journey, everybody can't come, which is an episode I did on the podcast before. So go back and listen to that. Everybody can't come. And that's okay. Everybody can't come. So I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Be sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com after you listen so you can find out more about Valencia, about her book, and about the resources mentioned in this episode. You just go to the search box and type in Valencia. P-H-Y-L-E-N-C-I-A, and her show notes page will pop up. All right, so now, without further ado, Valencia Taylor. So, Valencia, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yes. Excellent. So, first question, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? I was a late bloomer, and I'm... I, call myself a a self-professed late bloomer. So um, I had few entrepreneurs in my family, so it wasn't something I could model myself after. Um, I believe it was um, after college. I moved from Atlanta to D.C., and I saw a different type of energy and just the the, uh, independence of it. And so I started started doing, like, moonlighting, and I worked in the, the wine and spirits industry. And so... When I saw people doing it in that way, um, it really sparked my interest and the freedom of it sparked my interest. Did you grow up in Atlanta or do you grew up in D.C.? I grew up in upstate New York, um, oh, okay. Buffalo, New York, small town, Buffalo, New York. Um, and then I went to school in Atlanta. I moved around quite a bit, went to school in Atlanta and moved to D.C. after uh, undergraduate school. So um, where did you go to school? I went to Clark Atlanta University for uh-huh. undergrad, okay, and then I went to American University for graduate school. What did you study? What did you think at that time that you were going to be when you grew up? <laughs> oh wow, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do. <laughs> right, when I grew up. Aren't we all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I just knew that um, I knew I wanted to help people, but I also had a, a a business mind. So I went to undergrad for business administration, and I concentrated, focused on international business. So I thought it would be more of an import-export situation, which I believe it will still evolve into that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, that, that's what I was thinking. I just knew business. You know, I came from, you know, my family. Uh, my mom was a teacher and she was a business teacher. And so I kind of 
kind of didn't know what I wanted to do initially. So, um, and this was uh, 95 years ago, so it's a little bit different now. <laughs> right. So, um, I, I knew it was going to be business, and so that 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 part I did know. What was a young Valencia like growing up in upstate New York? Oh wow! Believe it or not, uh, I was very shy, and I still can be, but I was very shy, um, and um, I danced. So I, and I won a couple pageants. So mm. I, you know, kind of became popular from that, or not popular, but you know, it's a small town, so people people know small city rather. Um, and um, I started school in the inner city, and then I moved out to the suburbs for high school, and it kind of changed my perspective of life a bit, mm -hmm. um, just because of the demographics, uh, the concentration of students. Um, there were maybe 50 multicultural students in the school, including myself, of a school of maybe, I don't know, 1,600. Mm. So, it, yeah. <laughs> what kind of experience did that give you overall? Um, it broadened my horizons from a socioeconomic standpoint where, you know, we moved from the city to the suburbs. And I saw people that, you know, were a lot a lot wealthier mm -hmm. and you know we didn't have lacrosse in the city we didn't have horseback riding we didn't have skiing in the city um but those were all sports that were offered at my school and so seeing that it was it definitely you know changed the perspective so that was the good part of it but the other part of it is i saw you know i, I think i saw racism for the first time i hadn't seen it before high school um and i think as a as a teenager i experienced that firsthand um but the other part of it is, is that my world became a lot more multicultural at a younger age where I was engaging with people that were that didn't look like me. So, you know, there, there are pros and cons to it all. Mm -hmm. It teaches you a different way of operating in the world. I feel like I went to I lived in a uh, predominantly black neighborhood, but went to school where myself and only one other black girl in the class from first through eighth grade. Oh, wow. So it was <laughs> it was quite <laughs> interesting, but it just I don't know. It's a unique experience. It is. And you become the prototype and you become the, mm. the benchmark and you become the go to and you're under a micro a micro a microscope. So it's a different, definitely a different experience. Who would you say were some of your greatest influences growing up? The women in my family, I have um, strong women in my family that um, make things happen and are, you know, persevere and go getters and, you know, spiritual women. Um, so I would say my mom. And uh, my aunties. Now, when you were, you mentioned that you always thought that you would go into business and that kind of thing. What was your first step after, co well, I know you worked in wine and spirits and that kind of thing, but how did you transition into the beauty industry? I worked in wine and spirits. Um, and from D.C., the job that I had, they moved me to New York. I worked with um, U.S. Concepts, which is an extension, at the time it was an extension of uh, LVMH and Diageo. And today, I think they're under a moniker called uh, Marketing M MKTG. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I moved from D.C. to New York. And um, I had some friends that said, oh, you know, there's an opportunity. You should, you know, apply for it. Because I just, I just wanted to explore. And I kind of went on an exploratory interview um, at Wella Corporation that was moving a small division of theirs to Hackensack, New Jersey. Sorry if you hear a truck, I'm outside. <laughs> um, and I went on the interview and they offered me a job and they offered me like like $20,000 more than what I was making at the time. And I was, you know, a little bit younger. I had just moved to New York a year before. And um, that was my first job in the, in the beauty industry. And since then, you've been in the beauty industry for more than a decade now, right? I have. I've, I've been in the beauty industry in different facets. Right. Um as a brand manager at a couple of different companies. Um, also, even on the agency side, I did, I went back to Wine and Spirits. I kind of combined that where I did um, Crown Royal Barbershop and um, Bailey's Beauty Shop. So I, I managed some of those programs nationally, uh, combining, you know, beauty and spirits, which sometimes goes together well. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I've been in the industry for a while. So in 2007, uh, which was 10 years ago, I started uh, Shine Beauty Culture, which is a consultancy that I have now. Um, but I started as a trade show at the Indiana Black Expo 
that transformed into a print magazine, Shine Magazine. You know, we got such a great reception. So we did Shine Magazine. It was a print magazine. It was quarterly. And it was sent to um, salons, spas, and barbershops. And then when the print industry um, took a dive and the economy took a dive, I transformed that into the consultancy that I have now. And um, after 10 years in the industry, last year, I wrote my first book. Um, I was a brand manager at Carol's Daughter. So Lisa Price was gracious enough to write the foreword for the book. That's amazing. Uh, I saw that. Yeah. She, and today happens to be her birthday. How about Happy that? Happy birthday, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, Lisa. Yes. Um, so I have just really have been focusing on the consultancy and growing the evolving beauty business because I launched um, a second book this year, which is a planner. Um, and evolving beauty was inspired by creating the tools to, um, to boost the evolution of success. And like I said, I'm a late bloomer. So I created things or I'm creating, continuing to create things um, that I need or that I needed as a, you know, as a young woman entering into the beauty industry, entering into entrepreneurship that I didn't have, um, that I think are needed. And I'm like, if I needed them, then I'm sure there are other women that need them as well. So I wrote the business book first. And then this book is a planner. And both are called Evolving Beauty. Correct. So the mm -hmm. first book is Evolving Beauty, The Business of Beauty in a New Age. It's kind of marketing 101 times digital 2.0. Um, because I think people forget that underneath e-commerce and underneath the world of digital and social media, there's still core marketing values that we need to support branding. And yes, it has changed, but there's still some fundamental things that exist to create longevity because that's what I'm all about. Like making small brands become big brands and big brands become legacy brands. Mm hmm. Now, did you start Shine Consultancy while you were still working full time in the beauty industry or what pushed you to decide I'm going to set up my own consultant business? I started um, I started the consultancy actually in between con consult. I was I was doing some contract work, basically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes contract work feels like you're really an employee there. And that's right. how I felt at the time. <laughs> That's how I was feeling at the time. And I said, you know what? I need to I need to really launch this because I can't continue in this way. Like, this is not working for me. So I was still contracting, in quotes, so to speak. But um, it felt like a full-time job to me, which, was, which meant I was doing it all wrong. Um, and so that's where I launched the consultancy. And in what ways would you say that your um, agency really supports the clients that you work with now? Um... I think that because we are niche and because of the experience that the people that I work with on our team, on my teams, um, we offer research, we offer um, sales, and we also offer marketing and communication packages. So what's different about us is we offer experience that you really can't get and quality that you really can't get other places, um, but also fixed term, fixed price. So. Our packages are all on our website at uh, shinebeautyculture.com. And, you know, we want to grow with you. So it doesn't mean we can't have a long-term relationship with you. But most of the time, we're working with smaller businesses. So we offer prices that, that meet, your, meet you where you are. And we offer packages that meet you where you are so you can shine through the clutter and you can grow. That, and that, that's kind of what makes us a little bit different. And who would you say your ideal client is or who have you found to be your ideal clients? It's not, is it just someone who's in the beauty industry or what kind of businesses have you mostly worked with? Our niche and our focus is beauty, but we also do do other businesses. I just had a, um, a lawn care company, oh. um, reach out to me, which is a little bit different. So, um, Shout out, shout out to the Avens for their lawn care family business. So I've done some other things, but um, our, our real focus is beauty. And that's kind of what, because the industry, every industry has its own niche and specialities. But, you know, this is what I've been doing forever. So I, I love beauty industry. So I have that expertise to offer. What do you think most people misunderstand about the beauty industry in your experience? Um... One of the things that is sort of a pet peeve of beauty manufacturers or small beauty owners 
is that they continue to create new products without understanding the life cycle of a product, you know, understanding the adoption period of a product from a consumer standpoint. Um, and you're going to have lots and lots of inventory if you just keep making new products without creating penetration or line editing through them. So I think really focusing and, and sometimes you can create a portfolio of products and then you end up with two or three heroes and let's focus on those heroes. And maybe we don't need to keep creating products because it's expensive. So I would say um, just not really understanding the life cycle that it takes mm -hmm. and really some of the penetration that it takes. And I think sometimes a digital age um, skews the reality of what's actually happening because it's instantaneous. And I think that that sometimes skews the, the potential. You know, it, everything looks beautiful and fabulous and glossy and shiny. And it, it takes hard work. Right. And really, the, the, it comes down to how is the product selling, right? How, exactly. Because it's a push-pull. It's a, You can push it onto shelf. You can push it into e-commerce. You can push it into your inventory. But how are you driving consumers to pull it out and to purchase it? And that's really, you know, the key factor. Mm -hmm. And what would you advise for people who do have who are uh, have beauty products or or want to go into that business in just in respect to what you just said? Is there a way to know when a product is working um, and when it's not? Or does it depend? I think that it's relative. It's relative to the product. It's well, it's relative to a few factors, including um you know, here's a, a pro. I said a couple of negative things about social media and digital, but, you know, it's relative to what your consumer response is. And so even if your sales are not moving, are people still engaged with you from a social media standpoint? Are people interested enough for you to do other things? Mm -hmm. You know, you can restage and, and grow a product that may not seem like it's going well by creating a 360 degree program or creating a campaign that will create some buzz and, you know, do some seeding. Sometimes I think you have to go back to some guerrilla marketing tools, you know, um, and really create excitement for, for a brand without um, without letting it die. So I think that there's a maturation cycle and there's a there's a period to decide, but it's not a one a one time or, a, you know, it's not a black a black answer. It's it's, it's gray and it, it just depends on the brand you know, the, the distribution, how, you know, how, what channels are you going through? What's your consumer response? Do you have the inventory and the resources to continue to put into a brand? I think a lot, there's a lot of factors in deciding to line edit or to add on to a product. And is that something that your consultancy would help a client with as well? Is that one example? Abs absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that we do is called um, the beauty, beauty breakthrough theorem. And I speak about it in, um, I speak about it in the book, Evolving Beauty, the, the business book. And so it's a proprietary um, theorem that we created that gives you a gauge of how you should navigate. And it's based on it's really based on two other theories, the um, adoption theory and the, the life, the life theory. These are established theories. And then we add our own proprietary on it. And that's what makes it different from a theory and a theorem. Just just to, to define that. Um but we create uh, we created the beauty breakthrough theorem as a navigation tool on how you can break through the clutter and shine through when you are deciding oh you know what let's create a line extension or you know is is this product over have we has it run its course should I should I partner with this this group or this person we have the beauty breakthrough theorem and it's a great tool that we use for our clients um, on your first steps you know when you're creating your business plan when you're creating you know, your budget for the year. And that's another thing people don't do. But we actually have all of those tools at uh, Shine Beauty Culture Consultancy. Excellent. So let I'm me sorry, I'm a little long winded. Sorry. No, you're perfect. <laughs> I love it. It's perfect. I okay. was going to um, ask you, though, I noticed on your site, evolvingbeauty.info, that you seem to really position beauty as a tool of empowerment, looking yes. at how to use it as a how would you say that um, you shifted in just your knowledge of, or how, not shifted isn't the word, how have you used your knowledge as a, someone who has worked in the beauty industry so long to sort of look at it or see it as a, a tool of empowerment? Um, you said it correct. It's, it's, there's a shift because mm -hmm. originally I was in it, one, because I love beauty and I was in it because I wanted to be an employee. And when I decided I didn't want to be an employee anymore and I wanted to be an entrepreneur, a consultant first and then an entrepreneur of sorts, um, 
I wanted to create more value. Mm -hmm. And in creating that value, because sure, we like the beauty industry. It looks great. It looks pretty. But I wanted to create more value. And in creating that value, you know, um, that's where Evolving Beauty was inspired from. Again, me being a late bloomer, there's some tools that I wish I had had early on in my career, such as mentors, such as just some business fundamentals, um, such as, you know, the sponsor in the corporation. Um, and then also how to guide my own life. You know, what are my priorities? What is my passion, my purpose, and how much money or profits do I need to, to give back and to support and to, just to, to do something different? So in two ways, when I shifted from being an employee to an entrepreneur, it made me look at the world and life and women and things differently where, and also what I want to do with my, my legacy, not sure what that will be yet, mm -hmm. but it made me shift and think of it in a different way. Um, and also that's where the planner is. So 50% of the planner that I created, uh, which is about prioritizing your life and it gives you tools to guide and, you know, understand what your, what is your yearly, you know, personal statement. And how can you guide that from month to month? And how can you break that down in a framework tool so that every day you're, you're working towards what you said earlier was your personal statement for the year? So, you know, we, we set these big business goals, but we don't always have the tools. Or we, sometimes we don't even have the background to help us structure our personal lives that we can achieve them. You know, if, mm -hmm. if your house is a mess and your, my, my mom used to say, if your house is a mess and your car is a mess, your life is probably a mess. So how do you get yourself organized, especially as moms, as wives? You know, we have so many things to do. Um, how do we get our personal lives so that we can align our personal lives with our professional lives and create, be happy and successful? And that's the title of the planner. It's uh, Evolving Beauty, the Planner, Essential Tactics to Being Happy and Successful. Because we know lots of people with lots of money. We know lots of successful people. Success is relative. We discuss, discuss that in the book. Mm -hmm. But they're not always, they're not always happy. You know, they're not always happy. And the worst thing I want to do is when I get to the multimillionaire status and I'm not happy. How can that be? Like, what are we working towards? What is the point? Right. So I, I don't want to be that. And I refuse to, to be that when, when I become that. I, I just refuse to, to be that. And so I would like to have a tribe around me that's happy and successful. Tony Robbins says, uh, and I always quote this, success is nothing without fulfillment. Yes. So you have yes. you said these millionaires, billionaires, all of these people, not that all of them are unhappy, but they're we assume that they would be, but if they're not fulfilled, it just doesn't work. And, and that's that's what I that's you're you're so true. I mean, that's so true. That's what I learned and that's that was part of the inspiration for it because in my 10-year career in corporate agency consulting, I've been in boardrooms, VIP rooms, backstage production rooms and I spent a lot of time with C-suite executives in different ways mm -hmm. and I'm like how and you know you get to share things you end up you know you go to their homes or you you know you go to their kids birthday party and you see you know different parts of their personal lives and it lets you understand like wow like they're so wealthy and they have everything you could think of but they're not really that nice mm -hmm. or they're really they're really angry or like wow she's really a witch you know what right. I mean like you really get to, to learn and see what's really happening up close and personal. So that was part of the inspiration for the book. So what would you say, uh, speaking of the title of the book, Essential Tactics to Being Happy and Successful, what would you say you've learned about being happy and successful while creating these projects? In the midst of creating the projects? <laughs> mm -hmm. In the midst of or after? Or um, did it change your mind or, you know, shape your view or change your view in any way about this, what we just talked about being happy and successful, what it looks like or what it means to you? Well, one, I'll, I'll say a little bit of what it means to me. And I think that, and what I learned through through developing both of these projects is that one, you know, just keep on living because life is, learning is an, is an evolving process and mm -hmm. success is a journey. It doesn't just happen one, one day and you're successful because once you obtain that goal, you still have more life to live. And so you're going to stop learning or you're going to stop growing or you're going to stop evolving because you've attained a couple of goals or whatever you deem as successful. Um, and I just feel like, you know, we have so much to learn, like no one knows everything, you know. And also for me, um, it made me remember that work is not does not define you, you know, your work does not define who you are. 
And I think I had to had to remember that, you know, you know, when you go to come to my my service, my funeral, um, I, I don't think many people are going to say, oh, she worked so hard right. or oh, she was she was such a great, you know, and I, you know, I worked so many hours. I used to work so hard and so long and spend so much time and I still do. I still work hard, but I need that balance, you know, and I think I, I it really reinforced everything as I was writing the books and I was I was developing them it reinforced how much balance is in your life because I was like wait a minute I'm kind of unhappy right now <laughs> <laughs> I'm becoming one of those people <laughs> exactly so uh yeah just the, just really creating that balance in your life what would you say entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself as a woman strength I think you develop a strength that you didn't know that you had um, for me, a strength and a pers- perseverance, um, and which e- with each each goal that I've achieved, um, it, it reinforces again that wow, like you know, I didn't I didn't know I could do that, you know, and so it gives it builds your confidence, it's strength and confidence for me. Would you say that there's been any um, any lessons that you've learned along the journey that have been a surprise for you? Uh, I would say my, uh, the people around me sometimes, I I think it surprised me, the responses, you know, everyone's not always happy for you, even though you think they are, or you think they should be. And it's disappointing, Mm -hmm. but you have to understand it and respect what it is. And, you know, understand that everybody has different, uh, everybody has a different emotional maturity Everyone has different levels of confidence and insecurities, and we all have insecurities. And sometimes it's never personal, but sometimes people don't know how to project that. So I, do I necessarily think that this person is jealous? Maybe not. Maybe they just don't know how to project that they want to do something else too, mm-hmm. you know? And so it's a little disappointing. I just have to love them from afar. Yeah, I did a podcast episode sort of about that, just this idea that everybody can't come. Everybody can't come. Everybody can't come. And it's not everybody can't. (laughs) Like you said, you can, you know, (laughs) love them from a distance and that you're going at your own pace. And some people will want to keep up. Some people won't. So how do you um, do you is loving them from afar the way that you deal with something like that? Because that can be hard. I know I've been through that where um, not necessarily people are negative, but sometimes you think, oh, I thought this person would, you know, fill in the blank. And it's sure, sort of like sure. We have these expectations of people and sure, they're in their sure. own thing. <laughs> they're doing their own thing. No, that's a great one. I thought this person would in my, you know, I thought they would show up. I mm-hmm. thought they would offer. I, think, I thought they would send a text. I thought that, you know what I mean? You could fill in the blank. You're right. right. It is very challenging um, and it's emotional, you know, it's, it's emotional and sometimes it can be very lonely. Yes, ma'am. It can be very lonely. They, you know, that book, it's not easy being green. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when you know your path or you know what you're driven to do and people don't, when people don't understand it, it's just the beginning of time. They call you crazy. They call you disenfranchised. They say you're bougie. They, you know, people create labels for things that they don't understand. That's mm-hmm. just life. That's just what people do. And so um, it can be it can be emotional. It can be very lonely. But if you if I sleep every night, if I go to bed every night and I understand, and I realize I've done nothing to this person. Um, then for me, I'm like, I just need to keep evolving in my tribe. That's you know, nice. I, my tribe just needs to continue to evolve. So tell us about your tribe. What does your support network look like? Um, I do have a good support network. Um, it is small, but it is a good support network. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and it's and it, the great thing is that it varies. It, it has a lot of different variables. Like everyone's not in the beauty industry, which is great mm-hmm. um, because you get different energy. Uh, I'm also I'm a single mom, so I have to have a, a support system. You know, I can't do this alone. Mm-hmm. None of us can do this alone. We That's all need right. help. Support we, we is all need sexy. Support. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Support is sexy. So um, personally, you know, I have my mom. um, I don't have a lot of family here, but I have my mom and I have really good girlfriends from college because I live in Atlanta. um, And that they they they're my savings grace, my Mm -hmm. savings grace. 
And then I also have a small network, uh, a professional network that I consider my close friends at, as well. So between the three of them, the three of those different tribes, and all of them don't know one another, which is also good sometimes too. Mm-hmm. Um, it keeps me sane and it keeps me going and it keeps me inspired. And it, at least it, it tries to keep me, you know, happy and hopefully successful. Of course. So if you think of your life and your career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? That is a really good question. <laughs> um, um, I'd have to just thank God, honestly. I just have to thank God. I can't say one person. I can't say one. I I can't. I would have to thank God and, you know, my belief in in the inspiration of it and and the support of it. Um, I can't thank one person. Mm -hmm. Has it been too many people? Not too Uh, many. Has it been many? No, there hasn't been many. No, there hasn't been many. It's it's kind of been a it's it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle. Um, But there have been people that have helped. Lisa Price, of course, you know, mm-hmm. I appreciate people like her. Um, when I worked at Blue Flame for a while, there's some good people over there. Erica Pittman helped me a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's been a, a, a few, mm-hmm. maybe uh, Paul Estevez, he's over at um, at uh, the agency, I forget the name of it, um, but he's over there. He's helped me quite a bit as well. So I... I say you know not not there hasn't been a whole lot but there, there of course people have helped me of course they have listen yeah. nothing wrong with thanking god i'm not trying to get anybody other than that <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that so tell yeah. us how we can support you i'll have links of course to your websites and social media but tell everyone just where they can find you and all that good stuff sure um you can find me at evolvingbeauty.info is the website and those are also my handles for uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter is underscore Evolve Beauty, but everything else is evolvingbeauty.info. And you can email me at info at uh, shinebeautyculture.com or info at evolvingbeauty.info. Info at shinebeautyculture.com. Yes. Okay, great. So people can reach out to you. Fantastic. I love it. Don't be surprised if you get some emails. Oh, I love to. Thank you. Please, please bring them, send them my way. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much for your time today and taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us. I appreciate you. No, thank you. I appreciate the, the talk. And I appreciate that it was thought provoking. Like you, you actually made me think about some of these answers, which oh. I don't often do on, on interviews. So oh, thank you. <laughs> that's good. Such a compliment. Thank you. You're now, welcome. Be- before you go, Valencia, what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything? I would just say try and do. If you if you don't make an effort, you'll never know what you're capable of. And you don't want to you don't want to take your your ideas and your inspiration and your spirit to the grave. So just try. Give it a try. So many people don't just try. Excellent. Valencia Taylor, hold on just a second. Sure. All right, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Valencia Taylor. Again, be sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com. Go to the search box and just type in Valencia, P-H-Y-L-E-N-C-I-A. And her show notes page will pop up with all of the resources there, how to get in touch with her, and links so you can pick up her books, Evolving Beauty. Also, I really appreciate you guys listening. You know this. And I appreciate that some of you, many of you, in fact, have gone and left a review for the podcast, which is something I've been asking for at the end of each episode. Subscribe because I want to make sure you don't miss anything. So subscribe wherever you're listening, but also leave a review if you love the show or not. But I'd really love to hear from you if you love the show. So I really appreciate you all leaving me reviews. Want you to know I'm seeing it and I'm very grateful. Some of the people who've left reviews recently, Raina Campbell, who was a wonderful guest on our show. Show, actually. Also, Benno James, Kyra Akita, who was a guest early on in the process. And you have to listen to Kyra's show, Inspired Interim. If you haven't heard it, she just launched a podcast a few weeks ago. She has a season one. This is season two. It's fantastic if you love storytelling podcasts, if you're in Hollywood or interested in Hollywood and want to be in that space and hear more about the behind the scenes of it. Kyra is 
hilarious, first of all, but a great storyteller. So thank you, Kyra, for leaving a review. But for all of you listening, whoever you are, wherever you are, I would love to hear from you. So please leave a review for the podcast. As I always say, I'd love a five star review. So far, we have almost 50 five star reviews. But whatever your feedback is, I'd love to hear from you. Again, thank you all so much for listening. I appreciate you. And now you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care.